Well, good morning, everybody, and it's the 12th of September, 2021, and we are looking at the Word of God. I want to turn, please, to Genesis chapter 17, but can we just pray, Lord? We are earnestly seeking your Word this morning. We want to hear from you, and we thank you, Lord, that you have given us all we need for life and godliness. You've given us the Word of life, the truth from heaven to man, and we praise you for it. We ask you, Lord, to speak to us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the title of my talk is, Can Ishmael Live? Can Ishmael Live? And I'm looking at verse um, 18 of Genesis 17. Well, I'll just sketch in the background, although I guess most of you will know, but Abraham is married to Sarah, and the Lord has promised that there will be a child, a baby boy, uh, and in that child's life, and future and descendancy will be um, the, all God's blessing and purpose for Abraham would be visited there. And that would be essential. And they were to wait for that child to be born. They waited, I think it's 25 years. And Sarah, no sign of it. And so they, uh, Sarah's suggestion, he marries the <coughs> Egyptian maid, Hagar, and she bears a child, Ishmael. And the Lord is speaking to them again and reminds them that they're going to have a son, he's going to have a son by Sarah. And he makes this in verse 18, he, he makes this request to God. Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Would you not accept what we have done in place of what you have planned and intended and told us will happen? Would you not accept what we have done instead? Well, of course, that, that's impossible. It, asking God for something that cannot be. Now, our lives as Christians are subject to huge promises. And I want to just look at Ephesians 3, page 1164, to remind us of this, the, the wonder of what God has done for us and, in, and, and has given us in Christ Jesus. This is page 1164, Ephesians 3. And here we see, and chapter 1 is kind of similar in some ways. Chapter 2 is wonderful because it speaks about how when we were dead in trespasses and sins, God brought us to life. Christ gave us life. It's a great thing, isn't it, about the Lord Jesus? You know, the last Adam, we're told, again, don't go there, but in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, first Adam, a living soul. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. You has he quickened, brought to life, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And there's so much more in chapter 2, which I, I don't want to go to, but... Paul is praying for them. I'm in Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. And this time, there are many times on this Christian journey, this spiritual journey, when we could be weakened, and that could even tend to take us to a place where we will not fight the fight of faith, but we will want to take a step of our own when God wants us to take hold of what he's got for us. And it's, it's something which he will give us. I love that concept. It's more than that. It's an absolute truth, isn't it? To grant you to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. World without end. Amen. 
that fantastic, isn't it? The, the, the thing that God has done for us in Christ. And what a fool I would be to move away from faith into my own works, into what God has given me by believing, into something which I will do. It might be very well-meaning. The idea with Hagar, very good idea, they thought. We need a baby boy. We can't wait any longer. And it'll be Abraham's son. It's not a, no real problem there. The genes are going to be there. And you can see how they would have talked themselves into this. But it isn't what God has said is to be. And there's such a danger. And to say, God, please, could you accept works instead of faith? Could you accept the flesh instead of the spirit? Could you accept my plan instead of yours? That's what it comes to, doesn't it? Hopeless. And, you know, this, this couldn't be a more fundamental issue. It goes, to the, it goes to the core of spiritual reality. It really does. It's just like the Garden of Eden, where the enemy, with his subtlety, and we know he was subtle. Paul says that, he uses that word, doesn't he, in um, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, when he's warning the church, don't get caught like Eve did. I want to present you as a chaste virgin, no unfaithfulness, ready for your, your bridegroom. And, um, oh, the way it's put, well, here's a thought. Did God really say that? Really? Maybe God's wrong? That's, that's what Satan is really trying, that's the seed that Satan is really trying to plant. It's just the same thing. Are you going to go God's way? Are you going to fight the fight of faith? Are you going to wait until what God has said comes to pass, believing, waiting, patiently? Or are you going to do something different? Well-meaning, seems good, hopeless. And the offer that he makes, that the, in, right at the beginning, the evil one, you know, the offer of knowledge, power, fulfilment. But really... His, 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 his motivation, his intention is completely disguised. Completely disguised. Inside, there's a searing hatred of God, a longing to destroy every human soul, to spoil the universe, to climb up to that place of power that he wants to get to, which he can never get to, of course. You see this again, don't go there, but in Isaiah 14 is the best place to see, and Ezekiel 28... The best, passage, the best passages in the scriptures is to see where that fallen angel's ambition is described and you see the point of it and, the, and you understand it as far as such a thing can be understood. But something that is so important to be understood is this. And Romans 8, again, don't go there, but Rome, Romans 8 tells us that the natural mind is death. It's death. It cannot know God. It cannot please God. It is at war with God. And I'm paraphrasing exactly what Romans 8 in the first few verses tells us. It sounds extreme, doesn't it? Now Ishmael, he is Abraham's son. This is the result of a, of a well-meaning attempt to get a baby boy. They've waited 25 years. I think I'm right in saying that. It's a very long time anyway. But it cannot work cannot work. And can I say this? God's plans, they're always precise and they're always non-negotiable. Always non-negotiable. I mean, it sounds so hard in one sense. Actually, nothing is easier than making up my mind I'm going to obey God. In every situation. Once I've really come to that place, I won't say life is easy, that might be the wrong word, but I know his burden is easy, uh, his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. But I've got to make up my mind about this, friends. And I'm so, I know I'm talking to the converted, and none of you will disagree with what I'm saying, but, but the fact is, 
And then it's so subtle that so often before we know where we are, we've moved away from that, that life of faith, that act of faith, into something that is, we're ne- if we are saved, we're never going to, well, God forbid, but we're never going to be at war with God in the sense that we will uh, defy him willfully. Of course not. That, that's not the issue. They weren't doing that as a willful act of defiance. Well, in nature it is that, but that wasn't from their hearts. That wasn't their motivation. They need a baby boy. We're getting old. And, and your promises, you, Lord, you said this, your promises are wrapped up in Abraham having a baby boy. It's got to happen. And the trouble that it's caused in this world, actually... <laughs> God's plans are always precise, they're non-negotiable. And you see, God's intention, and if you go just to Genesis 22, and I'll just read this, because it's a few pages on. His intention through this means, God's means, not through their method of doing what they think God wants, but through his means, is fantastic. I mean, Genesis 22, remember, this is where He's got Isaac and he's been called to sacrifice Isaac and it's just to the point of doing it and the Lord intervenes. And um, in verse 18 he says this. This is God speaking to Abraham who's passed that test, terrible test. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. But Sarah and Abraham, you know you need this baby boy. It's too late for Sarah got this young Egyptian lady and it wasn't adultery, they, ma- they were allowed to marry, it wasn't, didn't sin and, and this will work, no God's, God's plan is so immense in Isaac all the nations of the earth are to be blessed by this means by this means and we know don't we, it's absolutely clear to us obvious that that is through the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, from that natural line, that racial line. There's a, there's a reason for it which God knew about, they didn't know. God has a plan that is going to be massive, and their little effort is going to just ruin it. And God, he wouldn't have allowed that to happen, but he would, would have done, would have done. So I hope I'm getting the point across, the principle across in the um, drawing from this episode, that, that illustration. Now, it's about freedom and slavery. And if you go to Galatians 4, where this, case, this matter is, is raised, actually. I'm on page 1160 if you're in the church Bible, Galatians 4. And what an amazing epistle that is, and, and the thing that it, that it addresses. You know, it's, they've, um, they've been saved in that place where the Galatians live. Because, the, because God's servants have come with the true gospel in the power of the Spirit of God, and their souls have been saved and they've been brought into the family of God. And then someone's come and spoiled it. And it's basically said, look, you can, ca- you can start in the spirit and carry on in the flesh. And I think we won't go into it in detail, but <clears throat> as you'll know anyway, the theme of this book. Let's just look at chapter 3 actually on page 1158 because <clears throat> the way it is put, it's shocking really. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Well, we know who's done it, don't we? We know, and he's used human agents, but we know who's done it. The word is pretty clear, isn't it? Bewitched. That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently evidently set forth. You know the Son of God. You know he died for you. You know there's no salvation anywhere else. You know that none of your efforts, a lifetime of effort, won't get you right with God for a second. You come this way or you don't come at all. This is what he's reminding them of, which they knew. 
And then he puts this question. Um, I'll, I'll ask you just one thing. This only will I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law. Did you behave so well God rewarded you with a baptism in the Holy Ghost? Of course not. That never has happened, never can happen. Or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? You've begun in the Spirit. Are you going to now be made perfect by the flesh? Are you going to depart from what God has done into something which is natural and cannot ever work? And then on the next page in chapter 4, at the end of the chapter, he makes reference to this. I mean, chapter 4, verse 28, to this occasion we're talking about, the Hagar and, and Ishmael. <clears throat> verse 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. It was a long battle of faith. They had to wait. They slipped up. But it had to be that. Had to be that. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. And very cruelly, actually, and very sadly, they did chuck a Hagar out with a, with a little boy. That Sarah's doing. Sarah was getting resentful because I think maybe Hagar was a little bit unwise, which you don't know, do you? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. The son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not of the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We are going to live by faith. We have finished with our own ideas. We will never make that attempt to do what we know God wants, but in our own way, without seeking his face, without getting that from him, which we have to get. If we've got to wait a few years, we wait a few years. But we're not going to go off the path. And if we do, it's a disaster. And we can't then say to God, well, God Lord, Lord, we haven't exercised faith. Would you accept what we have done? He can't accept that. It's a hopeless prayer. Oh, that Ishmael might live. He can't. Well, of course, he did bless Ishmael, and Ishmael became the father of many nations and all of that, but this was the seed that should possess the gates of the enemy and in which all the nations of the earth will be blessed through the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, through that line. And, that's what it, and, and we have to live by faith. To believe, to know whom we have believed, it's sometimes a huge battle, to reject all the natural, all that that's well-meaning, that offers solutions and, and seems to be devoted to God. We've got to reject that. And we've got to get that focus and keep that focus where we have simple faith in Christ. Naaman came to mind, and we needn't turn there, but if you want to read about it, 2 Kings 5. But you remember that great um, Syrian general who has great accomplishments and seemed to have a very great character as well, but he, he's a leper. It's a disaster. His skin is rotting away. Can't last much longer. And he's got this lovely Jewish girl, in, a captive, they've been at war, with, taken a captive. Instead of her being resentful and hating her master because she's been taken away from her village miles away or whatever, she cares about him. She's so godly, isn't she? And she says to, um, oh, that he might go to the prophet in Samaria, you know, that, that to Elisha he would get healed. And he goes. And you remember what he says when Elisha won't come down even to the door. And the reason is the man is full of pride and that's got to be dealt with. And he doesn't, he, he's a great man. He expects to be treated as such. You know, the prophet will come and see me. I'm me. I'm from, I'm Naaman from Syria doesn't know who I am. Elisha deals with that. And um, his servant comes to Naaman and says, Look, you've got to go to the river Jordan, bathe seven times, and your skin will come back like a baby's. And he's angry. Well, I thought at least he would come out and acknowledge me and there'd be a bit of a performance over me, you know, the crying out to his God and maybe laying hands on me, something like that. He wanted, he wanted a show that was consistent with his view of himself. And he says this, we've got better rivers in Syria. Maybe true. Maybe true. 
But God has said your healing will be in the River Jordan. You might think it's a little stream. It doesn't make any difference. There's just one way, Naaman, for you to get healed of your leprosy. Well, obviously, um, this brings us right to the point, doesn't it, about the Christian gospel, the truth of the Christian gospel. Many people are on a spiritual journey. I think, I think it's far more than we realise, you know. There's a lot of spirituality in the world. Many people. And um, drawing on this power or that power, or this teacher, that teacher, this demon, that demon, they may not know it's that, but that's what it is oftentimes. None of them can grant to the human soul the forgiveness, the healing, the restoration, the redemption that is only found in the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Only found in the blood of Jesus Christ. And you've a thousand and one, there's a lot of spiritual people, you've got a yoga centre just down the road, there's many others of different kinds of things. Look, Naaman, it's no good saying we've got better rivers in Syria. There might be better rivers in Syria. He doesn't argue with that. But God has said... Your skin will be healed and it will come again like a baby's skin if you do this. Go to the River Jordan, dip in the River Jordan seven times. And thankfully his servants are wise, they get round and he does it and his skin, he's completely healed of his leprosy. And leprosy is such a picture of sin in scripture. And you know when you've been washed in the blood of Jesus that you've been healed of a terrible disease. You know it inside you. You know it inside you. And you know... You could not have got it anywhere else. Any system of belief, philosophy, meditation, this guru, that guru, this church, that church, maybe, we don't have Christ. This religion, that religion, you know that what God did for your soul, you got only from Jesus and and it could not be got anywhere else. I don't know you, but and there's a, if you go to the end of the road, turn left up Tollington Park to the very end, Hornsey Road, that over to the left there's a, a spiritualist, spiritist I'd prefer to call him church, been there decades, many years, as long as I can remember actually. And my neighbour was going down there and he told me with great excitement, we heard the voice of Joseph of Arimathea. I said to him, look, the Bible forbids this. He said, I don't care what the Bible says. He's quite aggressive about it. So you're going to go continuing to listen to a demon who's pretending to be Joseph of Arimathea when you could listen to God? Are you insane? Yeah. Absolutely. He has deceived the minds of them that believe not. He will go and listen to his demon who pretends to, he might be pretend to be somebody else next time instead of listening to God he made a bad deal didn't he my goodness apply, the natural mind is at war with God very much as bad as that demon that deceives them I don't know how many demons maybe thousands of, over the years have been in that building and have deceived I don't know how many people and they're so clever they're so, the people are so vulnerable. It's, it's heartbreaking. Especially with bereavement, you know. Well, I got in touch with her. She, everything's fine. And she told me the cat needs her. And, it's, and how could anybody know if it wasn't her? Well, yeah, of course somebody knows the demon that's been watching you. That's, that's who knows. And he's sucking you in. So that's how it actually works. It's, it's bitterly sad, friends. We ought to weep for them. And be there ready to rescue them. Now, it applies to working together as well. Let me make this point quickly. And go to Ezra chapter 4, page 517. Ezra chapter 4. <clears throat> And they've, they've been 
Thank God the captivity is over after 70 long years. They're back rebuilding Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, and the enemies are there, the adversaries. The adversaries. They are against God. They're against God's people. They're against God's plan. And when they find out that, that the um, temple's being built, oh, that's a disaster. God's house being built. And you can spiritualize that, you know. Very much so. Stroud Green. Is God's house being built there? We've got to stop that. Yes. Adversaries. And they come to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers, and they said to him, let us build with you. Oh, really? For we seek your God as ye do. We're on the same side. And we do sacrifice unto him. Since the days of Esarhaddon, the king of, uh, of Asa, which brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua, that's high priest, and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us to build a house to our God. We ourselves together will build unto the Lord, our God, Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. He said, you have nothing to do with this. And we have, a, we have direct instructions from the king. Nothing to do with you. And so when we are in the work of God, we, we can only work with those whom God has appointed. Really? Times that's happened, people have come into it, many, over many, many years, you know, people have come in and, what a lovely brother, oh dear, you know the guy's a menace. Not even saved. And has an agenda. Can't, they can't work with those people. They can't work with them. And they, whom God has appointed, they have instructions from the king. And we are to get our instructions from the king, aren't we, in connection with all aspects. Now, God, God has a plan. And um, I think usually, I won't say invariably, but usually we have no idea about the details of that plan. And can I say this? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We all, what we know is this. We are to seek the face of God until the child of faith is born. That's it. It's as simple as that. In our own lives and in the life of the, of the church. So I'm going to read a prayer that's hopeless come to a conclusion Abraham said to God I wonder why he thought it well you do know why it's long long time of disappointment hope deferred maketh the heart sick and that's true isn't it every month they're waiting every month after month, month year after year nothing's happening well hey guys young she might just get a baby boy I bet she conceived immediately as well it makes that prayer, hopeless prayer. Oh God, that Ishmael might live before thee. Let's be those who never, ever want God to honour what we are doing outside of faith. Amen. Peter? Aha. Uh -huh. I think I may have lost.